Well, uh, when, I, when I thought about what I wanted to talk about here, I, I did want to uh, share some stories of me going around the country. I've been fortunate enough to uh, uh, be speaking around uh, the country, to some extent around the world, uh, primarily on innovation and on green technology and clean tech and sustainability and climate change. And I think you all are familiar with some of these topics. But as I did that over the last four or five or six years, I came to a new awakening. And it was a different awakening than I thought I would find. Uh, because I thought I would find maybe people who were really into innovation or people who were really into sustainability. And, people, and I found something totally unrelated to all of that, but somewhat related to my youth and the way I grew up in this country. And I sort of want to share that that story with you. So when I grew up, and uh, it, for most of my life, the United States has been number one in virtually everything. Whatever that meant to you, that's certainly what it was to me. But all of a sudden I realized we had become, as I've walked around this country and talked to people, sort of number two or number eight or number, that is, we're waking up not in an era where the United States is number one in everything anymore. And where we literally had this kind of pride. Sorry you can't see that because there's a lot of light on the screen. We, we had this pride around what we built in this country and what we built for generation after generation after generation and the opportunity that we had here. In fact, some of that is starting to be quite fleeting, quite different than what we had thought. Um, we are no longer number one in much of anything. You guys are here right now. I mean, in high school math, we're 17th in the world. Okay, you can see 25th in the world and the other things. So we are number one in a few things, but I don't think they're things to be necessarily proud of. These aren't the things we want to be number one in, yet we are number one in the world in these items. And we don't want to be number one in debt or anything else. So we can certainly do a lot better. Now, since the beginning of, I'd say the mid-1850s, even early 1800s, we invented everything for the world. Virtually everything in the world was invented here. Virtually every patent, our patent system worked, our invention system worked, our innovation worked. And in fact, there was an industrial revolution before us in Great Britain, but we took it over in 1850 in the US, and that's how we literally built the base of this country, the base of innovation. We made everything for the world. It was just an amazing time. Now, these are some of the plants from the you know, early 1900s, late 1800s, and mid-1900s that we built across the country to make goods, products, services, HVAC equipment, you name it, for the entire world. In fact, at one time during World War II, we converted all of the car plants within months to make all kinds of airplanes and bombs and things like that. I can't even imagine converting a car plant today. It would take three months just to have a meeting about converting it, let alone actually converting it. But we actually did that because it was really important. We had the wherewithal the guts and the capability to do so. But today, as I walked around the country, these are those same plants. Now, they don't look quite the same as they did when our fathers and, and grandfathers and great-grandfathers worked there and built this base in this country, in fact, built this base of technology for the world. And in fact, even our education system, as you could see on, on that earlier slide, is not what it used to be. Now, there's a lot of reasons for this. One of the things is government spend as a percentage of GDP is apparently out of control. Okay, that's not a chart that we can live with forever. And the way that breaks down, again, hard to see here, um, is not good. We continue to spend more and more and more on things that we just can't afford. We want them, but we can't afford them. Um, this is a lovely uh, thing of gross public debt in trillions. It's going in the wrong direction. Someone's going to have to pay that bill. But in the midst of all of that, there actually is opportunity. Now, I'm going to show you something that shouldn't be opportunity. Look at the worldwide CO2 going through the roof. We know this. This is driving climate change. And this actually can be an opportunity, because as this goes through the roof, as we know, temperatures have been rising for decades and decades. So where's the opportunity when something like that happens? Well, the opportunity is to correct it. And to correct it, we have to look at the kinds of energy we use. In fact, we use tremendous amounts of fossil fuels, as you know. By the way, wind and solar is tiny still today, about a little less than 1%, actually, today, of the world's energy supply, as hard as we've tried to address that. And worldwide energy-based CO2 is primarily in building operations and building materials. Uh, cars are only 9%, interestingly enough, and then you've got transport and industry. That's where, we use our industry uh, that's where we use our energy. And so now if we've identified what kind of energy we use and where we use it, look at all the things we get to reinvent. Whether it's motors or pumps or washing machines or lighting or the way we operate buildings or all of the supply side dynamics, we get to reinvent today. And this is, in fact, what America has always done best. However, this time, we're not alone. We're not the only people inventing out there. We do have some competition. And there's nothing wrong with competition, but it's real competition. Now, 
I'm not saying the competition is playing fair, and maybe we didn't play fair in 1850 either. They're limiting exports of rare earth metals, and they don't let their currency flow. But they are providing free plants if you go there and build a plant. They put $5 billion into LED companies so that they could make lighting for the rest of the world for the rest of the century. Very, very bright, bright thing to do. And in fact, the Chinese economy will surpass the U.S. economy in the next handful of years, three, five, eight years, and in fact, if they keep growing at the current rate, it'll be in the next few years. That's how fast, for sure, America will be number two. Now, in the midst of that, we got to do a really interesting project, and this was never done before. Everyone know what that building is? The Empire State Building. Thank you, whoever said that. <laughs> so it is the Empire State Building, and the Empire State Building was a tremendous project that was built in 1931, but could be upgraded. And this is an example of what we did. We replaced all 6,514 windows, 26,000 panes of glass, saving $410,000 a year in energy costs. Okay, that money can go back to the owner to do other things, can go back to the people in the building to do other things rather than waste it on spending energy. Now, while doing that project, I got to tour the Sears Tower, which is now the Willis Tower, 16,000 windows, that mechanical room Everything in 1971 had been made in the U.S. All this big HVAC equipment and boilers and chillers. And today when they want to replace that, guess what? They can't find any of that equipment in the U.S. anymore. And the reason is, is that this is the percentage of U.S. manufactured goods as a percentage of worldwide goods. And you can see we peaked somewhere around 1950, almost 50% 50 of the world's goods. And today, well, today we're around 17% of the world's goods and heading downward. So in fact, we make less and less. We add value to less and less things. Our cumulative trade deficit at the same time has done the same thing. As we made less, of course, we built more of a trade deficit. That means that, you know, we're not exporting very much. So we don't have very much money coming in, so we can't pay for stuff. So what does the U.S. do well? Well, IP, intellectual property, venture capital, public market capital, universities, entrepreneurship, and disruptive innovation. And that's what I'm going to take a moment to focus on, because we have been the disruptive innovators of the world. Now, this next person, you know, this, this slide has been in my slide deck for years. Obviously, he's on everybody's mind over the last couple of weeks. Clearly, Steve Jobs was one of the most disruptive innovators of our time, just without question. And he had a unique opportunity to come back to his company back uh, just a, a handful of years ago and reinvent what that company was doing from iPods to iPhones and eventually to the iPad. And all of them completely disrupted an industry like no industry has ever been disrupted before. I mean, even notebooks and netbook sales, netbook sales went away and notebook sales have decreased dramatically because of this device. He had a vision that you could do that. The bottom line today, if we want to disrupt and innovate, what we typically do in corporations is pull a team together. And people have a very difficult time innovating in a team. And the reason is nobody wants to take the risk of standing outside the team. Nobody wants to take the risk of standing outside the team. There is a purpose of this, and the purpose was instead of inventing Kleenex, let's, inventing so let's invent something that actually sucks all the stuff out of your nose instead. So that was the purpose of that entire slide piece there that we just got to the end, and that's okay. But the point is, is that when we, when we innovate in teams, which is typical of U.S. corporations today, nobody wants to stand out and say, I'm thinking way outside the box. Because if you think too far outside the box, you feel you're taking a risk. And someone on that team is going to go to your boss and say, you know, she said something really crazy. Like crazy, there's something wrong with her. And then you feel outside the team. And it turns out you have to be empowered to take that risk. You have to be absolutely empowered to take the risk or you won't take the risk. Now what Steve Jobs could do, what I can do, what others at sea level can do in corporations is take that risk. We're willing to risk the company, we're willing to risk our reputation, we're willing to risk everything by listening to the customers, finding their problems, and delivering something to them that will solve those problems. Now, I would never ask a customer what product they want, but I will ask a customer what problem they have. Because if I can find out what problem they have, we can go solve that problem. And we're not gonna solve it by pulling a team together to say solve that problem. You've gotta to listen to the customers, and either the team or individuals has to be highly empowered to take the kind of risk. Now, there are those kinds of risks being taken today. A lot of them are online, not just in the, in the clean tech and green tech space. Uh, you may know of Zynga. Anyone heard of Zynga? Everybody knows Zynga, right? Okay, that's got a huge valuation today, at least in the, in the private markets. These things are being valued huge. Groupon, everyone knows what Groupon is. It's got something like an $11 billion valuation heading uh, heading to a public offering. Uh, everyone knows what Facebook is, of course. Facebook is valued at something like $100 billion. These companies are highly, highly valued. In fact, they're so highly valued 
that us at Cirrus Energy started thinking, you know, how do we get that kind of attention? So everyone knows Mafia Wars. So we said, you know, Mafia Wars is an interesting idea, but how about we come up with our own game? How about we come up, instead of with Mafia Wars, maybe we can come up with Energy Wars, yes. And we can have people play online for where the energy is and where it's not going to be. I guess we could take it one step further as well. Everyone know Farmville? Yes, everyone know Farmville? Please don't waste your time with this. But nevertheless, there is Farmville. And we think if we're really going to educate the next generation, uh, we shouldn't be doing Farmville. We should be doing Climateville, you see? Because in Climateville, there's no water. There's nothing, nothing left. And there's a lot of different games you can play. This is the annual Dying of Thirst 10K Fun Crawl. Of course, they're just dying for thirst and looking for water. Uh, but in the midst of all that, and the, the, the jokes aside, uh, we do continue to develop and innovate at, uh, at Sirius. This is a soundproof drywall that's used in, in schools like this and hospitals and, and everything else where, where one layer can replace five or six or seven or eight layers. We've got window technology that's 400% better than dual pane, 400%. So huge improvements over what you, could, what you thought you could do. We've developed window and glass technologies that go into all kinds of high rises. And this is software technology that, in fact, operates this campus here. It's used on this campus called Cirrus Energy Manager. And we do manage the, uh, the campus through algorithms rather than just people. It's just an amazing technology. Now, a few years ago, at the height of the recession, we went out and rescued some plants. Here's a plant in Chicago where the owner stole the equipment, didn't pay the union. Uh, the union, all the workers were thrown out, and they did a sit-in. It's the first sit-in in this country in like 30 or 40 years. And they sat in and said, we at least want our 60 days of, of, uh, of, of uh, exit money, basically. And uh, everybody showed up, and he even showed up, and everybody fought for them. And eventually, in front of Bank of America, they went and... and, and uh, and uh, protested, and Bank of America finally came through and gave them their 60 days of severance pay. But the downside was the plant was now empty. There was no one there. They got their 60 days and nothing. So in fact, what I did around Christmas time, just before Christmas, December 17th, 2008, is I made a call, called the union, uh, partnered with the union, bought the plant. And then we reinstated that plant, and uh, he's in jail now. That's the old owner. So that's one idea of something that people can absolutely do, and it seems to work out pretty well. Now, in the midst of all the good stuff we're doing, we can't forget that we have competition on a worldwide basis today, which we never had years ago. And this competition is absolutely real, and it's, and it's serious. Now, you know, what they're worried about, or what we would look at them and say, look, we're not sure they're quite as innovative yet. They have a communist form of government today, limited IT protections, IP protections, environmental issues, and an aging population. So all of those can work for us at some level, because we're not perfect, and other countries aren't perfect either. There was a time in this country's history where the country banded together. When Sputnik was launched in the late 50s uh, by Russia, the Soviet Union at that time, we were absolutely shocked that they could put something in orbit when we couldn't even get a rocket off the launch pad. And that was an amazing time. Here, uh, Secretary Chu says, America was the unrivaled leader in basic and applied sciences. It was this leadership that led to these enormous technological advances. And in fact, I, I had the chance to visit the Jet Propulsion Lab recently, and all of our spacecraft, all our interplanetary spacecraft, are actually controlled from the Jet Propulsion Lab. And it was so amazing to see this is the next Mars vehicle that's not up yet, but they were working on it in the lab there in the clean room. It's amazing the technology we can still bring to bear today. And there's technology in the clean area. Here's net zero, literally net zero energy homes that are being built. They're being built in factories cheaper than you could build them on site. So tremendous innovation happening. We see innovation in chemicals. This is Genomatica that's innovated chemicals uh, to take out the fossil fuels that used to be in the chemicals. Uh, this is new kind of cement that's made without fossil fuels, without the use of fossil fuels. Uh, this, this is a bloom box that, that makes electricity out of natural gas or other biofuels or, or things like this right on site. Um, this is a brand new kind of lighting system that uses LEDs and uh, Silver Spring Networks that, that has a smart grid to, to do smart meters at your homes. Uh, bricks that are made uh, out of fly ash. And in fact, here we've been so innovative in regular steel processing that the rest of the world takes three to five man hours to make a ton of steel. We can now do it in one man hour. We've gotten that creative and that good at it, even in old line manufacturing. And that's something to really be proud of. So what are the things we have to do as a country if we sort of want to be number one, if we want to do things right again? 
And I started thinking about that and saying, first of all, let's keep our PhD students here. So when someone gets a PhD, they actually have a job here and we don't send them back to another country. Let's repatriate our profits that are stuck overseas. There's a lot of money overseas that we want to bring back. Let's start to invest in education. You guys got a great education. Those of you who've been to private school, but not everyone can get that education. And we need the best education in America. Uh, let, let's ask everyone else to play fair. I mean, that's just fair, right? It makes it a lot easier for all of us. Let's incentivize citizens to buy American, to be proud of the things that we still make here, and in fact, make more things um, here. Uh, incentivize companies to build plants here, and by the way, Arizona did that. Arizona actually uh, put a plant in the U.S., uh, 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 put a, uh, a regulation that says if you want to get $10,000 per roof of, of rebates for solar, you have to make them in Arizona. A Chinese company uh, actually went and built their plant in Arizona to take advantage of that tax break. Really, really smart. And in the end, we all, and your generation, has to out-innovate. Okay, we want you to out innovate your competition. We want you to out innovate everyone. There was a time in this country that I, you know, I watched this live. This is the Apollo 11 launch, and, uh, and uh, I was there. I wasn't there. I was watching it live on a television, or probably a black and white TV at the time. Uh, but this was the height of sort of America's prowess. If you think about it, the world stood back and watched as we sent men to the moon. And we sent men to the moon. It was absolutely unbelievable. So much so that some people still don't believe we actually went, but I believe we did go. And, and so to do this in 1960s technology, which you know, was a CPU that probably wasn't as powerful as my watch, is absolutely unbelievable. Absolutely unbelievable what we accomplished. And what I want to see for the next generation is that same hope, that same inspiration, the same innovation, the same things that took us there, I want to see in your generation. I want you to have this innovation. I want you to have the same opportunity that I had in the generation before me and the generation before that so that you can be proud of this country, you can be proud of what you learned here, you can be proud of what the country gave to you, and you can give back in absolutely amazing ways. Whether it's taking us to the moon or taking us to Mars or inventing the next online game, whatever it is, that's what I encourage you to do. So I hope you can be inspired, get innovative, stay innovative your whole life, take those risks, and take the next generation to where we were not able to go. Thank you so much.